Thank you everyone for joining me again in this three-part series where I narrate for you the ruling of the Privy Council in the Crown versus Vibes Cartel et al. And the judgment was handed down yesterday, March 14, 2024, one month after the hearing of the matter was before the Privy Council. Now I'm going to read the final paragraphs of the judgment where at last you will hear the ruling of the law lords. But before I do, let me welcome you if you are joining me for the first time. If you are, please type in the comment section, first time here. If you are not new, welcome back. If you have not subscribed to my channel, please consider doing so. Like, if you like the content, you give me a thumbs up. And share the video. And please, leave your comment. We would definitely like to hear from you. And what we'd particularly like to hear is how you feel about the judgment. Well, without further ado... Let me read for you the final segments of the Privy Council's judgment. Let me go on and hear now what their conclusion was. In other circumstances, it might have been possible simply to discharge a miscreant juror and to allow the remaining members of the jury to return verdicts where the judge could be confident that they would do so in accordance with their oaths and affirmations. However, that was not possible here. First, the requirement to discharge juror X led inevitably to the discharge of the jury because the trial could not continue with a jury of 10 members. Secondly, the judge had not examined the jurors other than the forewoman and was not therefore in a position to form an informed view as to whether they could still return impartial verdicts. Thirdly, as explained below, in any event, the contamination had spread too far. So, the judge is saying, boy, the, thing, uh, the, 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 the contamination was wide. The judge made some errors in the case. He should really have discharged the jury. And, uh, well, he should have sent home juror 12, which meant now the case could not continue because the law says the case could not continue with um, a jury, majority jury of only below 11. I think they haven't made an adjustment to the law now. I think they can now have trial by seven jurors, which I don't think they should do in case something like that happened. Now, in places like the United States, I recall watching the O.J. Simpson case way back in the early 90s, mid-90s. And they, what they have is a system where you have what is known as alternate, alternative um, jurors. So I think they have a panel of 12. And then they will have, um, I don't know if it's two or three alternate jurors. And all 15, 14 or 15 of them would sit together. So if something should happen and one is sick, or um or or you know one dies or for some reason they have to be dismissed one of the alternate jurors would then sit in that person's place and then the jury could go on this is something that jamaica probably could look at because i see no reason why we could not have had an additional jurors they will be there sitting with the other jury as kind of a backup in case something like this happened this would solve that problem in my view and it's it's fear and it would um it would also save us time it's fear to the defendants and it's fear to to well justice on a whole and that's my view the judges went on to say in this regard it is necessary to say something about a submission made by mr peter knox king's counsel on behalf of the crown which is the government of Jamaica. Mr. Knox submitted that since Jura X could be expected to argue for and to vote for the acquittal of the defendants, it was the prosecution and not the defendants 
who were likely to be prejudiced as a result of allowing the miscreant juror to continue to serve. However, the prosecution had approved of the course which the judge allowed. At the hearing in chambers, the D director of public prosecutions had expressly agreed that that course should be adopted. In those circumstances, Mr. Knox submitted, the prosecution may be regarded as having waived the irregularity and the judge was entitled to allow the trial to continue. The board is unable to accept the submission. Even on its own terms, it fails to take account of the wider implications of the mischief which had arisen, which are considered below. More fundamentally, however, it fails to appreciate what is at stake. We are not concerned solely with the rights of the prosecution, but also with the right of the defendants to a fair hearing before an independent and impartial court. The fact that the prosecution might be prepared to waive an irregularity does not absolve the court from its responsibility to ensure a fair trial. In order to maintain public confidence in the administration of justice, it is necessary to do justice to both prosecution and defense so that the guilty may be convicted and the innocent acquitted. Thirdly, the judge should have considered whether there was a real risk that the surviving jurors other than juror X might as a result of the approach and uh, whether consciously or unconsciously have become prejudiced for or against one or more of the defendants. This formation is taken from the judgment of Bingham, Lord Justice Bingham in Regina versus Putman, 1991, and they named the case. There, three defendants had been convicted of fraudulent trading after a long trial during which one juror had been discharged on grounds of ill health. During the trial, a second juror had been assaulted twice, and on the second occasion, he was admitted to hospital. This matter was reported to the trial judge, who discharged that juror and, after conferring with counsel, arranged police protection for the rest of the jury. The judge warned the jury not to hold any of, of the then defendants responsible for the assaults. After the trial had ended, the authorities were alerted to the fact that another juror, W, had been improperly approached and the Attorney General authorized a police protection. W said that she had been approached by a juror in waiting, M, who had offered her a hundred pounds a week to sway the jury to bring in not guilty verdicts. W had replied that she had not she was not interested, but the next day W found that M had placed 100 pounds in her pocket. W was frightened, but returned the 100 pounds to M the next day. When M was questioned, she denied offering W money. Eight other jurors were questioned. None admitted any similar approach, but two of those questioned declined to make any statement at all. During the trial, the judge and counsel were unaware of the attempted bribe. The criminal division of the Court of Appeal allowed the appeals against the conviction. It considered that there was a real danger that the appellants might have been prejudiced. So, the Lord Lords are saying here that in a previous case where there was jury contamination and bribery, the case was overturned. The jury was caught. The conviction was quashed on the grounds that there was a real danger that the appellants might have been prejudiced by all that was happening in that case. It went on to say,
Lord Justice Bingham, which is the person in the case, the judge in the case that I ju just cited, Lord Justice Bingham, delivering the judgment of the court, stated that, for the purposes of the appeal, the court felt bound to accept that W's account may be true, but need not be the whole truth. He identified the options available to the judge. Had the approach been duly reported to him when it occurred? As follows. So this is what Lord Bingham is saying. A. The judge might have discharged the whole jury and ordered a retrial. Or B. He might have discharged W and allowed the trial to continue. Or C. He might have allowed W to continue as a member of the jury and the trial to continue. In deciding how he should exercise his discretion, the judge's concern should have been to ensure that there was no real danger that the position of any defendant might be prejudiced. And then he quoted another law. So the Privy Council says now, in considering the options available to the judge, Lord Justice Bingham observed at page 286 now in his judgment. And they're quoting from what the, the judge said. It seems very unlikely that he would have thought it right to follow course C, which is to allow W to continue and allow allow W to continue as a member of the jury and continue with the trial. So he's saying it seems very unlikely that he would have thought it right to follow course C, given that W had shown herself to, had shown herself so inalert to her duty as to have left this criminal and highly improper approach unrevealed for so long. Hmm. So that's the first problem. This thing happened some time before and she never decided to bring it to the, the attention of the judge until some time after. So, so the Lord uh, Bingham is saying, you know, he, he probably wouldn't want her to continue. He went on to say, the judge would not, we think, have, left, have been able to eliminate the real risk that W might as a result of the approach and whether consciously or unconsciously, have become prejudiced for or against one or some defendants. No doubt the judge would have been guided in the exercise of this, his discretion by what his investigation revealed. Had he felt able to adopt course B, now course B was that he would discharge W and allow the trial to continue. So, had he felt able to adopt course B, he would no doubt have given the jury a very emphatic direction. So after discharging W, he would then turn to the remaining jurors and tell them, listen, and, and be very stern with them about what it is their duties are and, and so on. That's what that is saying. The appellants in Putman submitted that they were entitled to a fair trial by an untainted jury and that in the circumstances they did not receive it, allowing the appeal, Lord Bingham observed. So in that case, Lord Bingham allowed the appeal, and the appeal was that the defendants could not have received a fair trial because the judge allowed a tainted jury, um, juror to continue and the case to continue, and the judge accepted the appeal. So they won. So, this is now saying that in that case, um, where the Lord Bingham had allowed the appeal, Lord Bingham made this observation, and they give the page. It said, We cannot know whether M's approach swayed W for or against the appellants, nor whether the beer majority which convicted the appellants, Putman and Lands, would have existed without it. We should not make our own necessarily superficial assessment of the merits. A jury tampered with, as we assume this one was, is liable to give an uncertain sound. 
The high regard in which juries are held depends on their collective integrity and on the individual integrity of their members. If a source of poison is identified in time, it may be, and often is, possible for the poison to be isolated and neutralized. But we cannot view without grave unease verdicts reached by a jury when we know that there was a source of poison which, because its presence was unknown, could not be isolated and neutralized. When we do not know how far the poison may have spread and we do not know what effect it may have had. I apologize, this is seriously fine print. There is in our judgment a real danger that the appellants may have been prejudiced and we cannot regard the verdicts as other than unsafe and unsatisfactory. It was not suggested that we should apply the proviso to Section 2.1 of the Criminal Appeal Act of 1968, and this would be, in our view, be plainly inappropriate. We accordingly feel bound to allow these appeals and quash the appellant's convictions. Hmm, serious thing now. Sound like we're getting somewhere in this case. But this is what the, the judge is summing up now. Now, let me continue. So far, it looks like things are looking up for a cartel, but we can't run to, to judgment until the final word from the court. So let's continue. At 52, and it will soon be done now. Two points emerge with great clarity from this judgment. The first is that an improper approach to a juror may influence that juror for or against a defendant. In the present case, on the forewoman's account, which was the only account before the judge, an improper approach had been made to 10 members of the jury by the 11th juror X. In the circumstances of this case, there was a danger that the attempted bribe might operate consciously or unconsciously on the mind of other jurors so that they would overcompensate, for example, by assuming that the offer must have emanated from one or more of the defendants and that they must therefore be guilty. Remember I said that before? Right. That was what the appellant's um, argument was, their attorney. The judge took no account of this risk of overcompensation by jurors who had been offered bribes. Similarly, the Court of Appeal, while recognizing at paragraph 234 the existence of a risk that the jurors, being aware of the attempt at bribery, might have overcompensated against that threat by ensuring that a guilty verdict was returned, regardless of the evidence, failed to address it. In the board's view, there was here a real danger that jurors may have been influenced consciously or unconsciously against the defendants by the knowledge that someone was willing to bribe jurors to secure the defendants acquittal. Even some of us out here who were not part of the jury thought so. So that's a real, real serious point here the judges are making. At paragraph 53. The other matter emerging from the judgment of Lord Justice Bingham in Putman is that the efficacy and fairness of trial by jury depend upon the collective integrity of juries and the individual integrity of their members. In the present case, quite apart from the objectionable continued presence of jury X as a member of the jury, there was a real risk that the contamination emanating from his improper approaches had spread and had influenced the other jurors. In coming to this conclusion, so this is the conclusion that the board is making now. In coming to this conclusion, the board is mindful 
of the very serious consequences which may flow from having to discharge a jury shortly before the end of a long and complex criminal trial. It is also very conscious of the danger of deliberate attempts to derail criminal trials, in particular in their closing stages, by engineering situations in which it becomes necessary to discharge a jury. In England and Wales, legislation now provides that in certain circumstances it is permitted to discharge a jury because of jury tampering and to continue the trial without a jury but by a judge alone, section 46.3 of the Criminal Justice Act of 2003. However, in the absence of such a provision, and there is no such provision in Jamaica, there will be occasions on which, as in the present case, a court will have no alternative but to discharge a jury and end the trial in order to protect the integrity of the system of trial by jury. So what is he saying? This is basically saying that in England and Wales, they have a provision in their law that would allow in the case where the jury is contaminated, you know, because you know that people can think them smart. So what they do, they wait till the 11th hour, find a juror that they could bribe. Or if the juror himself is corrupt, nobody, nobody doing anything but the juror. Knowing that if he offer a bribe, it could derail the whole case, right? And so that would be a subversion of the course of justice. They put in their law a provision where if the jury has to be dismissed because of contamination, the jury will be dismissed and then the case will continue with that judge alone. They are saying that we don't have no law like that on our books. So, unfortunately, the only way um, this case could have ended is to simply dismiss the jury and then order a new trial. Um, that is what they are saying. So, our, our parliament may learn something from this judgment that in order to protect the integrity of our justice system and avoid these retrials in case somebody cute may want to, you know, tamper with the jury in order to get the trial thrown out because, let me tell you something, it's, it's more difficult on the prosecution to have to go back over a case because it means that if the people who were witnesses decide that them not coming or them end up dead, then that will be the end of that trial. So... What they are saying or what the our parliament might learn from this is that it may be a good idea that where a case has within it problems with the jury, where the jury has to be dismissed, make a law that's saying in such circumstances, then the case will continue with the judge alone. Because, you know, there are cases here, especially in the gun court, where there's no jury. And it's only a judge, single judge that is trying the case. So that could work here for us. So that is something that we need to look into. Anyway, they went on to say now, on behalf of the Crown, Mr. Knox submitted that if the board concludes that a serious irregularity has occurred in the course of the trial, this would nevertheless be an appropriate case in which to apply the proviso to section 14.1 of the Judicature Appellate, Appellate Jurisdiction Act and to dismiss the appeals on the ground that no substantial miscarriage of justice has actually occurred. However, in the light of our conclusion that the verdicts were returned by a jury which was not a fair and impartial tribunal of fact, there is no room here for the application of the proviso. So what happened here is that the Mr. Knox who represented uh, the DPP, the prosecutors, said to the board, all right, this is what we think is the approach. However, in the alternative, if the, the board does not accept our arguments, let us um, use a proviso in section 14.1. Um, that no substantial miscarriage of justice occurred. And what the board is saying 
um, this case would not apply because we have already concluded that they did not receive a fair and impartial trial. That's what that is saying. All right, so we are nearing the end. The jury retirement issue. All right, I think this has gone on very long. Let me continue because I can always split it up later on. And, you know, I think I'll take my own advice and end it here. So there will, in fact, be a part four. So stay tuned, please, for part four. And um, it, it, I think it will make for a better listening for you. So for part four, please click on that thumbnail you see in the top left of the video. And it will take you right to part four. Thank you so much for watching. See you then.